Welcome to another episode of Well, Don't Tell the Kids. I'm Janet Lee, your host, and today I'm speaking with my guest, Vadim Backman. I wanted to thank you very much for joining me today, Professor Backman. Thank you so much for having me. Professor Backman is in the biomedical engineering department, a professor at Northwestern University. You started out in physics, from what I understand. I was wondering if you could walk us forward from that point and how you may have made these decisions. That's correct. So actually, as an undergrad, I, um, I was a physics major, astrophysics. I wanted to study the evolution of the universe and the black holes, and most of quantum mechanics and cosmology. I was all into uh, black holes and the uh, theory of relativity, Einstein, and, and uh, it was fascinating. I think intellectually, it's a, it is a, a very challenging and exciting field. What I uh, started feeling, though, is, uh, is that I was always thinking how, how it is what I'm studying is, may, may help uh, real human beings. I think mm. that was always on my mind, um, and I just caught myself thinking a number of times is that whenever I was deriving some new equation, uh, I was thinking, well, can I use that? to do something practical that can change somebody's life. And, and then I came to a realization if, 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 if that's what my brain wants me to do all the time, then why wouldn't I just make it a kind of career out of it? And, mm. uh, and that's when I decided to switch to more bio-related uh, work to, uh, to address medical uh, problems. Uh, but my, my heart was always uh, with physical methods, and that's, I, I think what I'm doing now, which is a combination of engineering, uh, data sciences, uh, computations, and biology and medicine, is a perfect, uh, com- uh, perfect combination. So uh, I see that you made your way from St. Petersburg Polytechnic Institute to Boston, Cambridge area. That's correct, yes. And I'm a huge Red Sox fan. After my second team, I'm very comfortable with the cops. Uh, <laughs> but part of belongs to the Red Sox. Okay, I won't. I won't hold that against you. <laughs> I have a little excerpt from 2016 article from the American Association for Cancer Research. The title is "New Research Targets Cancer's Achilles Heel." So I just wanted to uh, share that and then see if you could illuminate that for us a bit. Of course. Quoting here. Finally, considering the influence of chromatin heterogeneity on the greater genomic landscape or the GGL, we propose a new class of compounds, chromatin protective CPT, which target the physical variations in chromatin topology. In this approach, CPTs or the chromatin protective therapies reduce the overall information space available to limit the formation of tumors or the development of drug-resistant phenotypes. So, what does that mean in plain English? That's a very good question. Paragraph, I, I think I was beginning to realize why is that so many high school seniors don't choose science as mm. their major. <laughs> <laughs> so let, let me uh, try to translate and maybe uh, just make a, uh, take one step back. So the, if you look at the uh, war on cancer, so to speak, that's what we... Uh, that's how we call it, war, cancer. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the search has always been uh, for some magic bullet or a new target or a new pathway, how to attack a cancer cell. And there are a lot of ways to kill a cancer cell. In fact, there are tons of them. And uh, it's really tough to be a cancer cell because everything is trying to damage your kill you, uh, even before we apply any therapy. Uh, cancer cells have... An abnormal metabolism, which makes them, which makes their life basically harder. They don't get enough blood supply. They they, they tend to starve to death in large mm. numbers. Immune system, our native immune system, without any drugs whatsoever, is probably killing 99% of tumor cells all the time. Uh, so it's really tough to be a cancer cell. And there are quite a few uh, pathway or genes or molecules, other molecules uh, that, that can be targeted by uh, some of the compounds. Um, and that's what chemotherapy does. Uh, in to a certain extent, that's what immune system does. Mm. That's what immune therapies do as well. Uh, there are targeted therapies. So the, our war on cancer has progressed by developing new and new targets, identifying new targets and new drugs to 
attack these targets and kill cancer cells. Uh, but at the same time, if you look at the statistics, we haven't made a huge dent on actual curing cancer, with a notable exception, and as a something that medicine can be really, and cancer research in particular, proud proud of. Uh, blood cancers, such as lymphomas and leukemias, melanomas as well. But with the exception of this special cases, uh, the kind of the major killers, cancer killers, such as the lung cancer, colon cancer, breast, mm-hmm. pancreatic, ovarian, etc., uh, we haven't really had a very significant progress in terms of curation. Mm-hmm. We can long patients' lives. We we certainly know how to do that. And my, my father has a stage for lung cancer, so I certainly mm-hmm. hope he can uh, live as long as possible. Every month counts, obviously. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we don't cure cancer that well. Uh, and I think one of the reasons is because that's what cancer cells do. They are super adapters. They know how to to change themselves really well. Uh, mm. Think of cancer not even as an organism, as a combination of species, kind of as an ecosystem. Mm. I know the expression life always finds its way. Well, that's really what cancer is about. It's almost like adaptation, evolution on steroids. Uh, so cancer cells, they, they know how to survive. We hit them with a new compound, new drug to attack a particular pathway. Yeah, we can probably kill some of them, but that the rest of the cells will will be able to to change their gene expression or acquire mm-hmm. mutations that would help them survive this therapy. They develop resistance, and they continue multiplying. In, 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 in fact, if we kill, let's imagine, even 90% of the cancer cells, the remaining 10% can regrow very quickly. They'll just thank us for killing off their competitors. Yeah. So think, of them, think of cancer again as a lot of different species mm. uh, together, competing not with a host, with, it, with themselves, basically. Mm. And, and that kind of tells you the, the story and also tells about, I guess, about the uh, futility of our attempts uh, of just trying to find one one drug, one pathway, one target, which is going to eliminate all the cancer cells. Life on this planet has been in existence for three and a half billion years at least. So far, nothing, no ecological change has been able to eliminate it. Uh, cancer is is life within our body. So it's, it's, it's a very similar parallel. Uh, so then if cancer is kind of disease of evolution and adaptation, so the question is, can we leverage the very same evolution and adaptation against cancer? Because that's one, I think, I think it's one of the pieces that has been missing um, so far in our attempts to cure cancer. What we have realized is that the structure of the genome uh, is a key regulator of how well cancer cells can adapt and evolve. So we have about two meters of DNA in every single nucleus of every single cell, including mm-hmm. cancer cells, two meters. Okay. Let me give you one analogy here. Unless you magnify this DNA one million times, so the diameter of this uh, molecule now becomes about two millimeters, the size of a Chinese noodle. Now you take this noodle, you stretch it all the way, and it will stretch all the way from New York to Dallas. You take this molecule and you put it within a New York size living room. So that's exactly, so that's how the nucleus of a cell looks like, depending on how this noodle is folded and packed gene expression is going to depend on. Mm. And in particular, what the packing of the genome tells the cell is how adaptive it can be, how quickly it can change gene expression. Uh, And that makes a big difference. Uh, Let me give another ecological analogy here. Imagine you have an animal and you change ecological conditions. Let's say temperature went up significantly. Right? Mm. So in the long term, uh, species or individuals with the right genetic mutations would survive and we will end up with a somewhat different species being formed. 
But in order for this to happen, this individual has to pass its mutated genes to the progeny. The individual has to survive. So there are two things in any evolution. There are two things going on at the same time. Uh, genetic alterations, genetic mutations, which are passed to the uh, progeny, but also transcriptional adaptation. So each DNA molecule, each gene has to be transcribed into a protein. Otherwise, it has no function whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, but what biology has learned in the past several decades is that the process of expression of a gene from DNA to a protein can be regulated at a number of levels. So the simplest thing and the cheapest thing an organism can do is to change the way they express their existing genes without actually acquiring a mutation. Cancer cells do the same, and they do this uh, extraordinarily well. Uh, mm -hmm. We have seen in the lab that if you expose a cancer cell to a chemotherapy compound, which is supposed to kill it very quickly, some cancer cells develop adaptation that helps them su survive this chemotherapy compound as quickly as within a couple of hours, well before any genetic mutation can happen. Kind of the, the, the slogan, their slogan is, live today, acquire genetic mutation tomorrow. <laughs> and, and that's kind of critical. And that's what... Uh, that's where the uh, structure of the genome plays plays such a big role, because it tells it doesn't tell cancer cells what to do. It tells them to do something. It allows them to change, mm -hmm. and if they can change, then some of them are able to survive better, uh, activate pro survival pathways, and eventually acquire useful mutations so they don't get killed by whatever therapy we, we can throw on mm -hmm. them. And so it, there are two sides of the story. On the other hand, on, on the one hand, it's a powerful survival mechanism of cancer cells, just like every other cell we have in our body. That's why we, we, we exist. But at the same time, this can potentially be translated into a principally new target and a new way of fighting cancer where we don't try to uh, work against evolution. We use evolution in our favor as a friend against cancer. Okay, so it's a shift in approach away from the silver bullet towards, I guess, under, not with the flow, but understanding how adaptive the malignancies are. That's correct. So the concept, mm -hmm. the concept would be to restrict the adaptive potential of cancer cells and at the same time use specific compounds, uh, ex uh, let's say existing drugs, immunotherapy, chemotherapy, it's targeted therapy to actually kill them. So you mm -hmm. have a strong approach. You, you, you do have to have a compound which kills them. Like I said, whether it's either it's a, a chemotherapy or, or immunotherapy, or targeted therapy, but at the very same time, you use additional drugs which prevent the very process of adaptation and development of resistance of cancer cells to the uh, cytotoxic compounds. I see. Can you just let us know to what degree do they have in terms of efficiency or efficacy in knocking out? Uh, this is still a <clears throat> fairly early stage mm -hmm. of research. Uh, we're not in a clinical uh, stage yet. Uh, any drug development uh, requires uh, several uh, steps, um, and we, we are fairly early. We still need to understand some basic processes, but we have had very successful studies in the lab. We had very successful studies in in animal models like mouse, rat models. So, so if if you have a mouse with cancer, we can take a really good care of it. Results in mice were indeed very, very impressive in a sense that we literally saw that tumors melted away within about uh, three or four weeks when we used one of the compounds which prevents. Uh, adaptability and another compound, which is, let's say, chemotherapy. Despite the fact that chemotherapy alone would not uh, make even a substantial dent 
on the metastasis and tumor size. So this is kind of an example of a patient who is put on chemotherapy or immunotherapy and it doesn't seem to be working. Bad news. But then as soon as you combine this uh, with another drug which, uh, which we're developing, which restricts uh, adaptability, uh, results are dramatically, dramatically better, and the very same tumors begin to disappear very quickly. So we have had very successful trials uh, in mesothelioma, pancreatic cancer, and ovarian cancer, some of the three really aggressive, highly resistant, very difficult, notoriously difficult to treat malignancies. But of course, we have to understand that these are animal studies, and mm -hmm. in the past, so in the past, uh, different labs and pharmaceutical companies they have had successful trials in mice. Uh, so that is a first step. What I think is different about this particular research is that uh, we're not just uh, finding another way of reducing tumor size. Mm -hmm. We are talking about uh, taking a drug which otherwise does not work on that animal and that making it work all of a sudden mm, without increasing the dose, without doing anything to the animal that otherwise would not be possible to do with a, with a, with a human being. Um, so we are excited about the animal, but uh, there are so many steps that we have to do in order to get to the uh, clinic. And after publication of our first paper in uh, Nature Biomedical Engineering. I've been getting a lot of emails uh, yeah. from people asking whether there's some of these drugs might be available uh, because you know they may have a relative or they may have uh, mm -hmm. later stage cancer and they're not responding to ther existing therapeutics. And, and unfortunately, it's, it, it is heartbreaking. But I there is nothing I can mm -hmm. do right now because it just will take some time before any of these compounds can be uh, used in humans. That's the way of uh, research and development, and especially in this area. It just takes a while, but that's very uh, encouraging and exciting news. And believe uh, me, I, I am certainly biased. I would like to get this uh, to mm -hmm. clinical as soon as possible, uh, in part because uh, my family has had a pretty substantial issue with, uh, with uh, history with cancer. Uh, my, my sister died from leiomyosarcoma a couple of, uh, well, uh, a little over a year ago. Mm -hmm. My father is uh, fighting uh, the stage four lung cancer, plus we have mm -hmm. several other uh, who are undergoing treatment right now. Mm -hmm. So there is no, there's no question. If, if there's anybody who would like to see this therapy in clinical care as soon as possible, that would be me. Well, thank you for sharing that just the role of science and research is, uh, I think, taken for granted sometimes, especially these days, but uh, it's very important, significant work. I wanted to shift gears slightly and just ask a little bit about, I noticed that there's a new building at Northwestern. It's the biomedical BME building. It's downtown from what I understand. I'm just curious, is that mostly a graduate research facility or are undergrads? When I was there, the BME was, department was with the rest of them in McCormick or the Technological Institute. Well, everybody's, everybody at Northwestern is very, very much excited about the new building. Uh, it's, uh, it is in downtown uh, in, on the medical school campus uh, right next to the uh, cancer center and right across the street from a few other hospitals like uh, Prentice uh, Women's Hospital and the Uri uh, Children's Hospital. So it's, it, it, it's strategically positioned right next to some of the best hospitals in Chicago, uh, the premier uh, cancer center, uh, very exciting development. It's state of the art. Uh, it's going to have a phenomenal infrastructure for all kinds of research at the interface of biology, medicine, biomedical engineering, uh, nanotechnology, synthetic biology, you name it. So everybody is, is, is very excited. Uh, we have started a new center focused on physical genomics and engineering. Part of it is to do more of the fundamental work, uh, trying to understand how the uh, genome structure affects uh, gene expression and cell function, organismal function. The 
uh, headquarters of the center is are going to be located in that in that building. It's a wonderful company which we will have, uh, including centers for uh, uh, regenerative engineering, uh, regenerative medicine, synthetic biology. So it's it is really a great opportunity to develop phenomenal collaborations. Right. So it's it, it is focused on the research. Uh, graduate students, undergraduate students, everybody will benefit because most faculty at Northwestern who do this uh, biomedical, uh, bioengineering research, they involve a lot of graduate, but also undergraduate students. In my lab, we have always had a wonderful uh, contingent of undergraduates uh, mm-hmm. who do phenomenal work. They publish papers. They they go to many of them end up in science. Uh, some end up in pharmaceutical companies. Uh, some go to graduate school. They they do a terrific terrific job, cutting edge research. So there will be a lot of undergraduates there as well, but also graduate students and uh, senior mm-hmm. more senior scientists. So everybody is going to be there under the same roof. Mm-hmm. Uh, the this the location right next to some of the best hospitals in the state of Illinois. That's a really wonderful uh, opportunity to mm-hmm. really translate basic research or engineering research into clinical practice. And uh, that's what you know, everybody who does uh, biomedicine, uh, biomedical engineering, that's what we want in the end, to see uh, our technologists in the clinic. Are the doors open now, or it's a little bit leading up uh, to it? Uh, almost. Okay, almost. almost. <laughs> um, some uh, some uh, floors are fully uh, functional, and some floors are still being uh, completed in a sense that equipment uh, needs to be moved in, but it's it's almost done. Okay. We're really like a home stretch before this building is fully functional. Yeah, well, we're seeing it out here on the uh, alum side. We're seeing it, you know, in the, the marketing, so... I understand that you have uh, you're certified in scuba diving, so I just wanted to find out what you do when you're outside of the lab or lecture hall. Do you have an opportunity to do scuba? I know you're out near Chicago, so I'm wondering how that works. Well, we have a, we have phenomenal coral reefs in Lake Michigan. No, I'm just, <laughs> you start, well with the global warming, you never know. Uh, if you, just, <laughs> you if you dump a little bit of salt in Lake Michigan, maybe at some point. No, uh, we certainly do not. Um, uh, my my wife is a is a very experienced scuba diver. She uh, is a marine biologist. She mm. wanted to study coral reefs, and uh, she participated in several um, expeditions. It sounds better than it really is. It sounds more glamorous than this work really is. Because if uh, when I when I talk about my wife's research. Uh, her name is Louisa Marcelina. When I talk about her research, people think, okay, well, that's wonderful. Uh, most of the work is done in the tropics, you know, Hawaii, Australia. Mm-hmm. In reality, what happens when you go on this you know, field expedition, you are on a small boat in the middle of the ocean for several weeks. If you don't feel good about it, jump in the water to feel better. That's yeah. the only... <laughs> fight that you have. <laughs> so, uh, but my wife, and, so Louisa Marcelin introduced me to scuba diving. So actually on our honeymoon, which was uh, about 13 years ago, I had no choice. I had to certify, I had to certify scuba diving. <laughs> uh, we are collaborating though, uh, because coral reefs are in danger of, uh, of dying as well. They bleach, mm-hmm. die at rampant speeds. Not everybody realizes the catastrophic consequences that this may actually cause. Imagine that you obliterate the entire equatorial ecosystem. That this would be analogous to the consequences if coral reefs uh, die. And the way things are going because of the uh, global climate change, uh, coral reefs are uh, on track of being com- almost completely obliterated by by the end of the century, even even before that, mm. in the uh, in the next 50 years or so, we'll see very very little coral reefs, and because they're essentially uh, the tropics or the equatorial forests of the ocean that support so many different species, all these ecosystems will will disappear. Uh, not to mention millions of people who will begin starving because they because their life livelihood depends on fisheries. So it's a very significant ecological uh, problem, and uh, 
uh, researchers like uh, like Louisa, they're trying to understand uh, the cause of bleaching, the mechanisms, and how we can stop that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I got involved in this, and so we are collaborating. So part of the work is indeed uh, diving, collecting samples, observing what happens to corals, serving, uh, surveying them, see which ones are dying, which ones are doing okay. Uh, we are collaborating with the uh, Field Museum. We are collaborating with the uh, Shedd Aquarium. Oh, so part of the work is done is done in the lab. Yeah, that helps me uh, convince myself that maybe I'm not such a big nerd after all. That <laughs> <laughs> right. there's there's nothing you know. The world needs all types, and <laughs> there's nothing wrong with with uh, that. Well, thank you very much for um, sharing just the the tip of that iceberg there. Well, that's about all the time we have for now. Uh, Thank you once again um, for your insights and conversation, Professor Backman. Thank you for having me. And thank you all for listening. Once again, my guest today has been Vadim Backman of Northwestern University. I'm Janet Lee. Please stay tuned for more episodes of Well, Don't Tell the Kids. (laughs) 